Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have a splendid show for you today. We're going to read from Wendell Berry's This Day Collected and New Sabbath Poems. This is Bob Beecher's idea. Wendell Berry was born in 1934 from the Poetry Foundation, I quote, poet, novelist, and environmentalist, Wendell Berry lives in Port Royal, Kentucky, near his birthplace, where he has maintained a farm for over 40 years. Mistrustful of technology, he holds deep reverence for the land and is a staunch defender of agrarian values. He is the author of over 50 books of poetry, fiction, and essays. His poetry celebrates the holiness of life and everyday miracles often taken for granted. In 2019, Barack Obama awarded him with the National Humanities Medal. Bob Beecher has chosen a superb group of poems from Wendell Berry's This Day Collected and New Sabbath Poems which was written from 1979 to 2012. I love the music, the cadence, serenity, and elemental simplicity in Barry's poems. To me, these poems are prayers, hymns of the spirit. From 10, 2002, Wendell Berry wrote, teach me work that honors thy work. Teach me patience beyond work and beyond patience, the blessed Sabbath of thy unresting love, which lights all things and gives rest. The outstanding readers in order of appearance are Corinne Conley, Bob Beecher, Helen Richmond, Kay Wiseman. Here's Corinne Conley. I go among trees and sit still. I go among trees and sit still. All my stirring becomes quiet around me, like circles on water. My tasks lie in their places where I left them, asleep like cattle. Then what is afraid of me comes and lives a while in my sight. What it fears in me leaves me, and the fear of me leaves it. It sings and I hear its song. Then what I am afraid of comes. I live for a while in its sight. What I fear in it leaves it, and the fear of it leaves me. It sings, and I hear its song. After days of labor, mute in my consternations, I hear my song at last, and I sing it. As we sing, the day turns, the trees move. Another Sunday morning comes. Another Sunday morning comes and I resume the standing Sabbath of the woods where the finest blooms of time return and where no path is worn but wears its makers out at last and disappears in leaves of fallen seasons. The tracked rut fills and levels. Here, nothing grieves. In the risen season, past life lives in the living. Resurrection is in the way each maple leaf commemorates its kind by connection, outreaching understanding. What rises, rises into comprehension and beyond. Even falling raises in praise of light. What is begun is unfinished. And so the mind that comes to rest among the bluebells comes to rest in motion, refined by alteration. The bud swells, opens, makes seed, falls, is well being becoming what it is, miracle and parable, exceeding thought, because it is immeasurable. The understander encloses understanding 
thus darkens the light. We can stand under no ray that is not dimmed by us. The mind that comes to rest is tended in ways that it cannot intend, is born, preserved, and comprehended by what it cannot comprehend. Your Sabbath, Lord, thus keeps us by your will, not ours, and it is fit our only choice should be to die into that rest or out of it. What stood will stand, though all be fallen. What stood will stand, though all be fallen, the good return that time has stolen. Though creatures groan in misery, their flesh prefigures liberty to end travail and bring to birth their new perfection in new earth. At word of that enlivening, let the trees of the woods all sing and every field rejoice. Let praise rise up out of the ground like grass. What stood whole in every piecemeal thing that stood will stand though all fall, field and woods and all in them. Rejoin the primal Sabbath's hymn. Too long for what eternity fulfills. Too long for what eternity fulfills is to forsake the light one has or wills to have and go into the dark to wait what light may come. No light, perhaps, the dark insinuates, and yet the dark conceals all possibilities, thought, word, and light, air, water, earth, motion, and song. The arc of lives through light, eyesight, hope, rest, and work. And death, the narrow gate each one must pass alone, as some have gone past every guess, into the woods by a path lost to all who look back, gone past light and sound of day, into grief's wordless catalogue of loss. As the known life is given up, bird call become the only language of the way. The leaves all shine in sudden light and stay. In the crease of the hill. In a crease of the hill, under the light, out of the wind, as warmth, bloom, and song return, lady, I think of you, and of myself with you. What are we but forms of the self-acknowledging light that brings us warmth, and song from time to time? Lip and flower, hand and leaf, tongue and song, what are we but welcomers of that ancient joy? Always coming, always passing, may apples rising out of old time, leaves folded down around the stems as if for flight, flower bud folded in unfolding leaves, what are we but hosts of times, of all the Sabbath morning shows, the light that finds it good? The year relents and free. The year relents and free of work, I climb again to where the old trees wait. Time out of mind, 
I hear traffic down on the road, engines high overhead, and then a quiet comes, a cleft in time, silence of metal moved by fire. The air holds little voices, titmice and chickadees feeding through the treetops among the new small leaves, calling again to mind the grace of circumstance, Sabbath economy in which all thought is song, all labor is a dance. The world is made at rest in ease of gravity. I hear the ancient theme in low world shaping song sung by the falling stream. Here where a rotting log has slowed the flow, a shelf of dark soil level laid above the tumbled stone. Roots fasten it in place. It will be here a while. What holds it here decays. A richness from above, brought down, is held and holds. A little while in the flow, stem and leaf grow from it at cost of death. It has a life. Thus falling founds, unmaking makes the world. Awaked from the persistent dream. Awaked from the persistent dream of human chaos, come again. I walk in the lamed woods, the light brought down by felling of great trees. And in the rising thicket, where the shadow of old grace returns. Leaf shadows tremble on light leaves, a lighter foliage of song among them. The wind's thousand tongues and songs of birds. Beams reaching down into the shadow swirl and swarm with gleaming traffic of the air. Bright grains of generative dust and winged intelligences. Among high maple leaves, a spider's wheel shines, work of finest making made touchingly in the dark. The dark again has prayed the light to come down into it, to animate and move it in its heaviness. So what was still and dark wakes up, becomes intelligent, moves, names, names itself by hunger and by kind, walks, swims, flies, cries, calls, speaks, or sings. We are all praising, praying to the light we are, but cannot know. How long does it take to make the woods? How long does it take to make the woods? As long as it takes to make the world. The woods is present as the world is. The presence of all its past and of all its time to come. It is always finished. It is always being made. The act of its making forever greater than the act of its destruction. It is part of eternity. For its end and beginning belong to the end and beginning of all things. The beginning lost in the end, the end in the beginning. What is the way to the woods? How do you go there? By climbing up through the six days field, kept in all the body's years, the body's sorrow, weariness, and joy by passing through the narrow gate on the far side of that field where the pasture grass of the body's life gives way to the high, original standing of the trees. By coming into the shadow, the shadow of the grace of the straight ways ending, the shadow of the mercy of light. Why must the gate be narrow? because you cannot pass beyond it burdened, 
to come in amongst these trees, you must leave behind the six days world, all of it, all of its plans and hopes. You must come without weapon or tool, alone, expecting nothing, remembering nothing, into the ease of sight, the brotherhood of eye and leaf. Slowly, slowly they return. Slowly, slowly they return to the small woodland let alone great trees, outspreading and upright, apostles of the living light. Patient as stars, they build in air, tier after tier, a timbered choir, stout beams upholding weightless grace of song, a blessing on this place. They stand in waiting all around, uprisings of their native ground, downcomings of the distant light. They are the advent they await. Receiving sun and giving shade, their life's a benediction made. And as a benediction said over the living and the dead. In fall, their brightened leaves released, fly down the wind, and we are pleased to walk on radiance amazed. O oh, light, come down to earth. Be praised. I climb up through the thicket. I climb up through the thicket, a bird song somewhere within it. The singer unfound within the song, resounding within itself and around itself. It might come from anywhere, from everywhere. The whole air vibrant with it, every leaf a tongue. I reach the last stand in my going of woodland never felled. A little patch of trees on ground too poor to plow. Spared the belittlement of human intention from time before human thought. They bring that time to mind. Their long standing and our longing to understand. But a man is small before those who have stood so long. He stands under them, looks up, sees, knows, and knows that he does not know. Explanations topple into their events, merely other events, smaller and less significant. They disappear, or die away like little cries at sundown. And the old trees receive the night again in dignity and patience. Present beyond the complex lineages of cause and effects, effect, each one lost to us in what it is. For us, the privilege is only to see within the long shade, the present standing of what has come, and is to come, the straight trunks aspiring between earth and sky, bearing upon all years, the year's new leaves. Or we may see this valley as from above and outside, as from a distance off in time, as Cezanne might have seen it, the light stopped, at rest in its scintillation on the bright strokes of the leaves also at rest sight and light entering from the same direction so that we see it shadowless for all time, forever. I come to a little bench, a mere shelf of the slope where four deer slept the night and I lie down in the deer's bed and warm in my old jacket in the cold morning of late April, sleep asleep as dark and vast as the deer slept or as the dead sleep, simple and dreamless in their graves, awaiting the dawn that will stand them timeless as they stood in time, and at last open my eyes to the bright sky, the luminous, small, new leaves unfolding. 
where the great trees were felled. Where the great trees were felled, the thorns and thistles grow from the unshaded ground. And so the falls renewed and all the creatures mourn, groan and travail in pain together until now. And yet their makers here, within and over all, now and forevermore, being and yet to be in columbine, oak tree, wood thrush, beetle, and worm, in song of thrush and stream, fact, mystery, and dream. Spirit in love with form and loving to inform form formed within itself. As thought fulfilled in flesh and made to live by breath, breathed into it by love. The violent past for now, the felling and the falling done. As a mourner walks restless from room to room, I cross the stream to find on a neglected slope the woods floor starred with bloom. What do the tra- tall trees say? What do the tall trees st- say to the late havocs in the sky? They sigh. The air moves and they sway. When the breeze on the hill is still, then they stand still. They wait. They have no fear. Their fate is fate. Bird song is all they've wanted all along. The winter, the winter world of loss. The winter world of loss and grief is gone. The night is past. Along the whole length of the river, birds are singing in the trees. Again, hope dreams itself awake. The year's first lamb cry in the morning dark. And after all, we have a garden in our minds. We living know the worth of all the dead have of all the dead have done or hope to do. We know that hearts against their doom must plight an ancient troth. Now comes the bride and groom. Now comes the man and woman who must begin again the work divine and human by which we live on earth. I went away only. I went away only a few hundred steps up the hill and turned and started home. And then I saw the pasture green under the trees, the open hillside, the little ponds, our house, cistern, woodshed and barn, the river bending in its valley, our garden newly planted beside it. All around the woods that had been stark in the harsh air of March had turned soft with new leaves. Birdsong had returned to the branches. The stream sang in the fold of the hill. In its time and its patience, beauty had come upon us, greater than I had imagined. I have again come home. I have again come home through miles of sky, from hours of abstract talk in the way of modern times when humans live in their minds and the world, forgotten, dies into explanations. Weary with absence, I return to earth. Good to see you back down on the creek, Martin Rowanbury would say if he were here to say it, as he'll not be again. I have darted, departed, and returned too many times to forget that after all returns, one departure will remain. I bring the horses down off the hillside, harness them, and start the morning's work. The team quick to the load along the narrow road. I am weary with days of travel, with poor sleep, with time and error, with every summer's heat and blood-drinking flies, and yet I sink into the ancient happiness of slow work in unhastenable days and years. Horse and cow, plow and hoe, grass to graze and hay to mow that have brought me here 
and taught me where I am. I work in absence, not yet mine, that will be mine. In time, this place has come to signify the absence of many and always more who once were here. Day by day, their voices come to me as from the air. I remember them in what I do. So I am not a modern man. In my work, I would be known by forebears of a thousand years if they were here to see it. So it has been, so be it. I leave the warmth of the stove. I leave the warmth of the stove, my chair and book, and go out into the cold night. My little lamp that shows the way and leaves me dark is swinging in my hand. The house windows shine above me, and below a single light gleams in the barn, where an hour ago I left the ewe in labor. Beyond is the grand sweep of heaven's stars. As I walk between them in the deep night, the lights of house and barn are also my stars. My own small light is an unsteady star. I come to earth on the barn floor where the used lambs have been born and now, wet and bloody, breathing at last the air of this wintry world, struggle to rise while the ewe mutters and licks. Unknowing, they have the knack of their becoming heartbeat and breath, the hunger that will lead them to the tit and thence to the sunlit grass. I perform the ancient acts of comfort and safety, making sure I linger a moment in the pleasure of their coming and my welcome, and then go, for I must comfort myself in sleep. While I work, the world turned an hour, carrying us on toward morning and spring the dark and the cold again, the births and then the deaths of many things, the end of time. I close the door and walk back homeward among the stars. They sit together on the porch. They sit together on the porch, the dark almost fallen, the house behind them dark. Their supper done with, they have washed and dried the dishes. Only two plates now, two glasses, two knives, two forks, two spoons. Small work for two. She sits with her hands folded in her lap at rest. He smokes his pipe. They do not speak. And when they speak at last, it is to say what each one knows the other knows. They have one mind between them now that finally for all its knowing will not exactly know which one goes first through the dark doorway, bidding good night, and which sits on a, on a while alone. A man, a man with some authentic worries. A man with some authentic worries and many vain and silly ones I am well schooled in sleeplessness. I know it from the inside out. I breathe and I know what's at stake, but still sometimes I'm sane and sound. However heart or head may ache, I go to sleep when I lie down with no determined care to breathe. I breathe and live and sleep and take a Sabbath from my weariness. I rest in an unasking trust by clouds and ponds and stones and trees. The long arising day will break if I should die before I wake. The best reward in going to the woods the best reward in going to the woods is being lost to other people and lost sometimes to myself. I'm at the end of my bespeaking wire to spoil my goods. I send no letter back I do not bring. 
Whoever wants me now must hunt me down like something wild, and wild is anything beyond the, the reach of purpose on not its own. Wild is anything that's not at home in something else's place. The good white oak is not an orchard tree, is unbespoke, and it can live here by his will alone. Lost to all other wills but heavens, wild. So where I most am found, I'm lost to you, presuming friend, and only can be called or answered by a certain one or two. Now you know the worst. Now you know the worst we humans have to know about ourselves, and I am sorry. For I know that you will be afraid to, you, to these of our bodies given without pity to be burned. I know there is no answer, but loving one another, even our enemies. And this is hard. But remember, when a man of war becomes a man of peace, he gives a light, divine, though it is also human. When a man of peace is killed by a man of war, he gives a light. You do not have to walk in darkness if you will have the courage for love. You may walk in light. It will be the light of those who have suffered for peace. It will be your light. Some Sunday afternoon, some Sunday afternoon, it may be you are sitting under your porch roof, looking down through the trees to the river, watching the rain, the circles made by the raindrops striking, expand, intersect, it dissolve, and suddenly, for you are getting on now and much of your life is memory, the hands of the dead who have been here with you rest upon you tenderly as the rain rests shining upon the leaves. And you think then, for thought will come, of the strangeness of the thought of heaven. For now, you have imagined yourself there. Remembering with longing this happiness, this rain. Sometimes there we are, we are there, and there is no death. Best of any song. Best of any song is bird song. In the quiet, but first we must have the quiet. Even while I dreamed, I prayed. Even while I dreamed, I prayed that what I saw was only fear and no foretelling. For I saw the last known landscape destroyed for the sake of the objective. The soil bulldozed, the rock blasted. Those who had wanted to go home would never get there now. I visited the offices where for the sake of the objective, the planners planned at length desks set in rows. I visited the loud factories where the machines were made that would drive ever forward toward the objective. I saw the forest reduced to stumps and gullies. I saw the poisoned river, the mountain cast into the valley. I came to the city that nobody recognized because it looked like every other city. I saw the passages worn by the outnumbered footfalls of those whose eyes were fixed upon the objective. Their passage had obliterated the graves and the monuments of those who had died in pursuit of the objective and who had long ago forgotten been forgotten according to the inevitable rule that those who have forgotten forget that they have forgotten. Men and women and children now pursued the objective as if nobody ever had pursued it before. 
the racist and the sexist now intermingle perfectly in pursuit of the objective. The once enslaved, the once oppressed were now free to sell themselves to the highest bidder and to enter the best paying prisons in pursuit of the objective, which was the destruction of all enemies, which was the destruction of all obstacles, which was to clear the way to victory, which was to clear the way to promotion, to salvation, to progress, to the completed sale the signature on the contract, which was to clear the way to self-realization, to self-creation, from which nobody who ever wanted to go home would ever get there now, for every remembered place had been displaced. The signposts had been bent to the ground and covered over. Every place had been displaced, every love unloved, every vow unsworn, every work unmeant to make way for the passage of the crowd, of the individuated, the autonomous, the self-actuated, the homeless, with their many eyes opened only toward the objective, went, which they did not yet pursue, perceive in the far distance having never known where they were going, having never known where they came from. You see, my mother said, you see, my mother said and laughed, <laughs> knowing I knew the passage she was remembering. Finally, you lose everything. She had lost parents, husband, friends, youth, health most comforts, many hopes. Deaf, asleep in her chair, awakened by a hand's touch, she would look up and smile and welcome, as quiet as if she had seen us coming. She watched, curious and affectionate, the sparrows, titmice, the chickadees, she fed at her kitchen window. Where did they come from? Where did they go? No matter. They came and went as freely as the time of her old age that her children came and went, uncaptured, but fed. And I, walking in the first spring of her absence, know again her inextinguishable delight, the wild bluebells, the yellow salandine, violets, purple and white, twin leaf, blood root, Larkspur, the rue anemone light, light under the big trees and overhead, the red bud blooming, the red bird singing, the oak leaves like flowers still unfolding, and the blue sky. By expenditure of hope. By expenditure of hope, intelligence, and work, you think you have it fixed. <laughs> it is unfixed by rule. Within the darkness, all is being changed, and you also will be changed. Now I recall to mind a costly year. Jane Kenyon, Bill Lippert, Philip Sherrard. All in the same spring, dead. So much companionship gone as the river goes. And my good workhorse, Nick, dead, who called out to me in his conclusive pain to ask my help. I had no help to give. And flood covered the cropland twice. By summer's end, there are no more perfect leaves. But won't you be ashamed to count the passing year at its mere cost? Your debt inevitably paid, for every year is costly. As you know well, nothing is given that is not taken, and nothing taken that was not first a gift. The gift is balanced by the total loss, and yet, and yet the light breaks in. Heaven seizes its moments that are at once its own and yours. 
the day ends and is unending, where the summer canaver, warbler, and vireo sing as they move among illuminated leaves. The cherries turn right. The cherries turn right, right. And the birds come, red-headed and red-bellied woodpeckers, blue jays, cedar waxwings, robins, beautiful, hungry, wild in our domestic tree. I pick with the birds, gathering the red cherries alight among the dark leaves, my hands so sticky with the juice, the fruit will hardly drop from them into the pail. The birds pick as I pick, all of us delighted in the weighty heights, the fruit red ripe, the green leaves like blue sky and white clouds, all ending to flight, making the most of this sweetness against the time when there will be none. And you are to me, my love, as a tree of ripe cherries. And I am a wild bird high in your branches, hungry, ready to fly. The kindly, faithful light returns. The kindly, faithful light returns. Morning returns, and the forgiving season. The pastures turn green again, blossom and leaf bud gentle the harsh woods. The warm breezes return to the cold river. The Phoebe returns to the porch, and I return again to my window. In the 40th year of my work in this room, I sit without working, and look out, an old man, into the young light. They are fighting again the war to end war. They are fighting again the war to end war. And the ewe flock, bred in October, brings forth in March. This so far remains. This pain and renewal, whatever war is being fought. We go through the annual passage of birth and death, triumph and heartbreak, love and exasperation, mud, milk, mucus and blood. Yet once more the young ewe stands with her lambs in the dawn light, the lambs well suckled and dry. There is no happiness like this. The window again welcomes in the light of lengthening days. The river in its old groove passes again beneath opening leaves. In their brevity between cold and shade, flowers again brighten the wood's floor. This then may be the prayer without ceasing. The beauty and gratitude this moment. I tremble with gratitude. I tremble with gratitude for my children and their children who take pleasure in one another. At our dinners together, the dead enter and pass among us in living love and memory. And so the young are taught. I go by a field where once I go by a field where once I cultivated a few poor crops. It is now covered with young trees for the forest that belongs here has come back and reclaimed its own. And I think of all the effort I have wasted and all the time and of how much joy I took in that failed work. And how much it taught me. For in so failing, I learned something of my place, something of myself. And now I welcome back the trees. 
so many times I've gone away. So many times I've gone away from here where I'd rather be than any place I know. To go off into the air for which my only gift is breath. For I have of myself no wings. It is death. Farewell, my dearest ones. Farewell, my lovely fields. Farewell, my grazing flock, my patient horses. Maggie, my ardent dog. Farewell, tall woods clarified by song. However long I've stayed away, coming home is resurrection. The man who has been gone comes back to his place as he would come naked and cold into his own clothes. And they are here. The known beloved, family, neighbors, obliging and dear. The dead, too, denying their graves, haunt the places they were known in and knew. Field and barn, river bank and woods, the familiar animals, all are here. Coming back, it's brightening in a grave. Such is the presence of old hymns. To the place we parted from in sorrow, we return in joy. The beautiful shore, eternal morning, unclouded day. Many with whom I mourned the dead. Many with whom I mourn the dead are dead and mourn no more. Blessed are they that mourn, for thus they have the fullest magnitude of love and learn of it, whereby the dead outlive their lives and live instead eternally in present grace, where death, ashamed, can find no place, for love goes with them, out of time, passing, and mercy welcomes them. Lest in our grief we lose our way, the dead lead back to light of day, nor their absence from us we mourn, but ours from them. And this we learn. Let us not condemn the human beings. Let us not condemn the human beings, self-appointed to serve machines. Poor humans, so weak of mind, so self-misled, so willing to risk heroic wrong. What's the satisfaction in condemning the self-condemned? Let them be answered by themselves, who grow smaller, their great works uglier, more lethal day by day. As we wish ourselves to be spared the fatal numbering, let us not confound offenders with offenses. May they come to mercy and to peace. But damn their bank accounts, inflated by the spent breath of all the earth of species forever chained to money. Let their legal falsehoods, corpses, corpses incorporated that cannot see or feel or think or care, that eat the world and shit money, fry in hell in their own fat. May their incarnate steel and fire that destroy the mountains forever be damned. May the chemicals be damned that poison the rivers and damned to the alien slop and fume that spoil the air, the water, and all the living world, sold, soiled, or burned. May the plastic trash that defiles lands and oceans, the machines that destroy the work of human hands, the mind-destroying mechanical dreams be damned, completely damned. 
be damned also to the incorporations of industrial war that is the triumph of every machine that will destroy any life and every life, any place and every place for victory that always is defeat. May the heartless speech of machines that break the heart of the smallest wholeness and may the radiant waste that has made geniuses idiots forever be damned. It's poor religion that cannot provide a sufficient curse when needed, but if you condemn the dire shortcuts and devices of the engineers, confess that you condemn yourself. You too belong in that litter and so much enter your guilty plea and so must come to your work. You must go ahead in opposition to the mechanical life, continuing also the creaturely task longer than your life of correcting yourself. If you love it, do not photograph. If you love it, do not photograph the woods as it is now, the leaves and sunlight and shadow hardly stirring in the air of the hot afternoon. Do not try to remember it, stopping the flutters of leaves and wings, the dead leaf slowly spinning in an invisible thread. Do not ask the trees to linger even to be named. You must live in the day as it passes, willing to let it go. You must set it free. You must forget this poem, then into its own time forever gone. It is forever here. A man who loves the trees. A man who loves the trees walks among them in a dark day for the solace he has taken always from the company of his elders. And suddenly he sees such a grace as in all his going. He is always going toward, though never in his foreknowing, among dullard trunks and branches, a dogwood flower white, lighting all the woods. There are seasons enough for sorrow. There are seasons enough for sorrow, but best be sorrowful in spring, when the martins at last return to their houses near the porch, the barn swallows to the barn, you can't be entirely sorrowful watching the swallows flying to live and ever delighted to be flying. They know perfectly that they are beautiful. And the good never is made less good by subtracting badness from it. Thank you all for such a rewarding, nourishing and quiet and also illuminating reading you all just did such a beautiful job thank you very much for all of you and let's just start at the beginning with corinne bob helen and Kay, and say what you would like to say about this reading and i just want to say it one more time thank you bob for choosing this particular poet and these poems it's to me it's personal i mean even though it takes place on a farm it could be taking place right here at mptf uh, what we go through here and the eternal and the present, but uh, thank you, Bob, for the choice of poet and great poem. So let's start with Corinne. Well, I, I, um, I, I love this today because I felt as though we were talking about this one man, and I pictured this one person on his farm, and it was like a story of his life, and uh, uh, so just following him along. Uh, I, I love that. And I, I, at the beginning, he was so forgiving, it seemed. I've forgotten what it was that I had to read. That he's, I thought he was more forgiving than he should have been about something. <laughs> but so that when Kay got to the self-condemned people, wow, did he get angry. But I think that's a 
<laughs> wonderful way to, to look at people who do ugly things and just call them self-condemned. They're condemning themselves and you don't have to do it yourself. I, I like that. <laughs> you don't have to condemn them. They self-condemn, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, Harry, uh, thank you for organizing this and bringing me together with these three beautiful readers, just lovely voices and emotions and uh, really bring the work alive. Um, I, I think you, you know, said in, in your introduction uh, something about elemental simplicity. And uh, for me, I, you know, I love all kinds of poetry. I, I think you know that. And we've had all kinds of poetry on this uh, show. But it's nice once in a while to read poems that you can really understand <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, don't spend a lot of time thinking, now, what was that all about? I mean, these are just wonderful, lovely, straightforward, deep-hearted spiritual meditations on the natural world, our place in the natural world, and, you know, the cycle of life, religion. Um, you know, I just love... Uh, Wendell Berry so much. I mean, it's not my religion, uh, but it's. I think it's all of our religions when he talks about Sabbath. And uh, I'm reading, I'm in the middle of reading right now a, a wonderful novel called The Overstory by Richard Powers, which I'd strongly recommend to people. And it's really about the life of trees and the complexity of the natural world and our and our place in it. And this this poetry just kind of uh, illuminates all of that. Ellen? Uh, Wendell Berry astonishes me in his beautiful passion as an environmentalist. And yet, as much as he despises what is going on in hurting our environment, he is still totally able to appreciate the beauty and the wonder of our world. And he has this quality where he's not like dogmatic about what he feels. He is open to, to thinking and open to change. And uh, I just love reading his poetry. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I felt the same way. And uh, I thought, oh, my goodness, if if he had the little patch of lawn that I have here in front of my cottage, <laughs> oh, my God, what would he write about it? <laughs> and it made me feel like a fool. So I'm going to look at every little leaf now <laughs> and cherish them much more than I have in the past because uh, it is sacred. This is sacred land. How lucky we are to have it. Well, also, just to end for me, it's a communion that we all shared here today. And it, as in any religion, whatever your belief, it's time out of time. Yes. And, uh, it's also the present and the eternal. And he has that great sense of unity, the cycles of life and death. So I want to thank you once again, Bob Beecher, for yes. joining Here's us. My pleasure. And Jennifer. Thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. You know, we got to do one more thing before we hand it over to Nikki for caption contest. What's up next week? Next week, we have two wonderful poets, Sandra McPherson, who lives in an elderly care home up in Northern California and a vibrant Pam Ward. So it'll be a wonderful reading. I love Pam. Don't miss next week. And thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs>